Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today on behalf of Rosie, who is over at Headspace recording some amazing content for you all to consume. And so I get the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Molly. And Molly, I should have had you pronounce your last name because I feel like I'm going to butcher it. So I will let you do that. It's Dr. Molly Maloof, like Maloof. Maloof. Okay. <laughs> That's how it looks, but you never yeah. know. You know? In, in Lebanon, it's Maloof. Maloof. But Maloof. in America, it's Maloof. Okay. Maloof. Cool. Yeah. That's a fun last name. I like that. Maloof. Yeah, it's a cool one. <laughs> so I'm going to refer to, is it okay if I call you Dr. Molly? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Molly is the author of The Spark Factor, Supercharge Your Batteries for Limitless Energy and a Fitter, Stronger, More Resilient Future, which just came out on January 31st. So congratulations on birthing this book of yours. I'm sure that was a quite the endeavor. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and it was so, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Right? Is this your first book? Yeah. First book. Yeah. So definitely, definitely an endeavor for sure, but I'm grateful I got the chance to do it. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad I got the chance to read it and I'm so excited for everyone else to get to pick it up. Um, and so you're also a physician and a lecturer at Stanford. Um, and, and so this is something that you study, obviously you're well-versed in it. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. I have like a long list of topics and millions of questions, but the top of mine are things like alternative milks oils, cooking oils, I'm thinking specifically um, fruit oils versus uh, something like a canola canola oil or a soybean oil. Um, I'm thinking about weight training as a Mm non-negotiable exercise. The word biohack itself, because I think to... I think to some people, it's a new term, but as you state in your book, it's not a new idea at all. Um, And because I'm a yoga teacher as well, I want to talk about posture and blood oxygen. Um, I could go on, but (laughs) let's start with those topics. Yeah. Um, I'd love to dissect the title a little bit to begin. The Spark Factor. Sure. I know why you chose that title. um, And we'll go from there. Well... I was really thinking about um, mitochondria a lot when I was writing this book. And it's like, how do you explain to people that there is literally this like electricity running through your cells? And how, when, you, when you think about electricity, you think about a spark, right? You think about the spark of of just like light. And every one of your cells has electricity running through it, through what's called an electrochemical gradient. So we create charge when we breathe oxygen and we eat food, we burn our food into what's called ATP. We literally extract energy from it. And that gets gives our cells the ability to do work. So without this flow of energy through our cells, we would not be alive. We'd be dead. Like without mitochondria, there is no life. So we inherit our mitochondria from our from our mom and dad, or, or specifically our mom. Um, our dad actually doesn't give us um, his mitochondrial DNA, but we get mitochondrial DNA from our mom. And then we get a little bit of DNA from our dad and our mom together, which forms our chromosome. But it's that mitochondria that is literally, what, those are the organelles that power life. So there was a lot of discussion early in like, I guess the last 20 years when genetics came out and there was a human genome project and everyone's like, genetics are the secret to all health and disease. And it turns out they were wrong and they were wrong by a long shot, even though genetics certainly play a role in health and disease. And there's plenty of diseases that we've literally cured because of understanding genetics. The vast majority of chronic lifestyle related diseases and mental health conditions are likely due to mitochondrial dysfunction as a result of how we live our lives. Mm-hmm. So um, 
That's what I, when, when I, when I talk about the spark factor, it's literally about this spark of life, this vitality, this energetic capacity that's in our cells that creates this charge that enables us to be alive and to function. Wow. Okay. Because that was my follow-up question. What is mitochondria? But it sounds like yeah. what you're saying is mitochondria is passed down from the mother and it is in well, the DNA, pro, the DNA plans. Yeah. And then you make your own mitochondria and then your mitochondria are basically power plants, but they're also batteries and capacitors. So they like create energy, but they also store it and then they deploy it. But they also do signal transduction and they help with adaptation to the environment. So they mod, they like modulate the stress response and they also help create stress to create sex hormones and they, you know, help modulate the immune response. They play a role in production of inflammation and they also play a role in what's called program cell death. So there's a lot going on on a cellular level besides making energy. Mm -hmm. So is this something that is mitochondria something you could see under a microscope? Uh, an electron microscope, they're pretty small, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't be very easy to see them necessarily, but there's spe very special microscopes that you can, you can watch and you can see. Interesting. That's my yeah. nerdy brain. Well, wonder. they're really, there's a really cool, I mean, I can send you a video by Douglas Wallace where like at the very end, they show a video of like mitochondria fusing together and, and resonating with one another. Uh -huh. So they're like literally communicating through electromagnetic communication. It's so crazy. These things are so fascinating. And in models of the cell, there's like a little mitochondria here and there. There's this like giant, there's this like giant nucleus. And there's like these little tiny mitochondria. That's not actually what things look like. There's like a lot of mitochondria. Like it's a huge amount of the cell mass. And for some reason, when people were drawing these cells, they just got these things wrong. <laughs> and so we've been like thinking that these are like these little tiny motors here and there. And it's like, no, they're like taking up a lot of space. Interesting. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to, if I could share that link, that video link in our show sure. notes. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's talk about biohacking. Um, I want to read a quote from you on the subject, and then I'm, I'm going to let you take it away. So women were the original biohackers. We had to be. Otherwise, our hormonal cycles from puberty to menopause would have interfered with our functioning and even our survival. Look back to what people have been doing for thousands of years before anybody ever thought to call it biohacking. And you will see that it has always been something humans, especially women, have always done. Okay, so first question. Sure. I mean, in your words, this, these are your words. Yeah. <laughs> but break it down for us. What is biohacking? And then talk to me about this specific function within the sure. human woman. So biohacking is basically changing, taking information from either your internal world or your external world and using that information to change your own personal biology. So scientific biohacking is like when you take measurements and you make hypotheses and you run experiments and you do interventions and then you track outcomes. So it's like the application of the scientific method to mm -hmm. your body, which is something that I do with every one of my clients. But when women didn't have science and, you know, we were in primitive times, we were just like figuring out our bodies, um, you know, long, long, long time ago, like men and women didn't know that women even made life. They just thought that people had sex and like people just, women just like magically produced humans. But eventually we figured out that like, oh, we actually create life in our bodies and like the sperm meets the egg and, you know, that's what happens. Um, and so because we are responsible for propagating the species, not that men don't play a role, but men men are much more involved with protecting um, than producing life, right? Because like mm -hmm. our job is to make the life in our bodies. So there's a lot of changes that go on in your life as a woman. You have your menstrual cycle starting. You have your menstrual cycle stopping. You have having children. You have breastfeeding. You have, you know, postpartum depletion, which can happen because you just created a human. And now you've used up a ton of resources, including literally the fat on your butt to create a baby's brain. I mean, like you're the interplay of a woman's body in the outside world is just phenomenal. Like there's so much going on with um, our physiology. And so when I think about women being biohackers, it's like, well, we had to figure out our fertility. We had to figure out how not to get pregnant. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, arguably birth control was actually created by men, but you know, it was interesting when they created it, they, they gave us a, a, a period, even though there was really no need for it because we weren't actually going to be, we weren't actually ovulating during birth control. So, um, 
women, because a lot of stuff has not been studied on women, like there's a lot of research that's just never been done on women. Um, most of the clinical research that exists today has been done on men. Women have had to figure out, well, what what's going on with my body? How do things work for me? And, you know, women with PCOS who have to go on a dietary change, that's biohacking. Women with infertility who have to like investigate why they have problems, that's biohacking. Women who are trying to, women who are pregnant and trying to figure out how to, you know, grow a baby in a healthy way by maybe implementing new fitness regimens or changing up their diet um, to become more metabolically healthy, like that's biohacking. Like managing gestational bio diabetes is bio biohacking. So there's a lot of, a lot of attention and, and tuning of our physiology that has to happen for us to be healthy. Like replacing hormones as you go through menopause, that's biohacking. In, in mutual fer fertilization, I mean, that's definitely biohacking, right? Like, and like even just using birth control methods and the variety of different kinds of methods that are out there is a, is a type of biohacking. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, back up to PCOS, poly polycystic, yeah, polycystic ovarian, ovarian syndrome. 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 Thank you. So this is something personally I get to experience in my body, FYI, mm. TMI, maybe for some. Um, it's really common. Yeah. That's what I'm finding out. Right. And I didn't realize that until I had to go through it. But yeah, I'm curious what you think about this, because you mentioned that in relationship to changing diet, which yeah. I did. And my symptoms decreased in terms of Amazing. Um, pain that I was feeling. Yeah. And the diet that I went on for, I think I did this about for three months was um, yeah. com almost completely vegan. Yeah. And that, that made a huge difference in how I was feeling in my body. And so yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, why that is. I mean, I'm kind of curious, like, um, what was your diet like when you went, when you changed your diet? So before that, I, I feel like I um, have always been such a healthy conscious eater in that I really, um, try to balance my macronutrients. So I try to get, um, a good amount of yeah. proteins, fats, and carbs. And I try to keep those healthy sources of macronutrients. Like I, I love my vegetables. Thank mm -hmm. goodness. I always get some of those in there. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm eating carbohydrates, I like to make sure they're complex carbohydrates so that they're digesting slower. So things like sweet potatoes or legumes or um, apples, things with higher fiber yeah. content, um, you know, wild rice or quinoa. Um, and then proteins, I like to make sure that it's a really good source of protein that is mm -hmm. um, generally pasture raised. And yeah, I mean, also to me, it matters, you know, the, the life yeah. of an animal. Yes, if I'm absolutely. Consume, like, how humanely were they raised and how mm -hmm. humanely were they processed? All that stuff matters to me. So I pay attention to it when I'm yeah. feeding myself. And I was also drinking coffee and wine. <laughs> because mm. Those are my two vices. Sure. Um, but I did try to scale that way back and just cut out any sort of animal product. Yeah. And it, it made a huge difference. So, and I, I'm not sure if that, that's... Do you do you have um, blood sugar data by chance? Do you I like know what your insulin levels are? No. Yeah. So like, you know, <laughs> this is a great example of like, I, I, I in the book, a lot of people are like, do you prescribe a single diet? Do you mm -hmm. tell people that they have, all have to be on the like the bulletproof diet? Because Dave Asprey wrote the forward. And like, as much as I love Dave and I really respect him, I've always had a problem with um, health gurus who recommend like a single diet to all people. Yeah. And the reason why is like, for you going on a vegan diet helped your PCOS mm -hmm. because that might be what you're best adapted to having as a diet. On the other hand, one of my friends, uh, Vanessa Fitzgerald in LA, she's open about her PCOS and about how she's on a ketogenic ancestral diet. And that's what worked for her. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really misguided for people to think that like, everybody should go on a single type of diet to get healthier because like you tried a diet that was like pasture raised and, and you were like, you know, you were eating foods that you felt were working for you, but it wasn't working for your physiology. And then you shifted to a diet that was a bit more of a plant-based whole food diet off of animals and boom, it improved things for you. Mm -hmm. The next step I would say for biohacking would be to check your fasting insulin, check your, um, your, uh, your triglycerides check your lipid levels and check your, you know, just check your CRP and just like, let's see, like, let's go, let's check your testosterone. And like, it'd be really, really cool if we could have seen your labs before and after, mm -hmm. because 
there's different paths to improving insulin resistance and not everybody needs to go low carb. I do recommend most people cut out like super refined carbohydrates and refined sugars, but it doesn't sound like that's what you're consuming in your diet. Um, a lot of people who do go vegan end up doing a lot of processed foods, but it sounds like what you're doing is a whole food vegan diet, which I think is extremely healthy. Yeah. I do try to eat as close to the earth as I can and yeah. stay away from processed foods as much as possible. And you know, yeah. I like, I like to indulge as much as anyone, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not completely rigid with that, but I do try to make that more like an 80% yeah. whole food and 20% indulgence. So yeah. I'm curious on the subject of checking insulin and, and getting blood work and stuff like that done. Is there a way to do that affordably? Like say we don't have health insurance and we can't afford to go through health insurance to get all of those, yeah. all that, you know, lab work done. Is there any other way to do that? Um, by this, do you mean like to get your, the data out of your body? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean like, so I, I do spend quite a lot of money of my own, uh, of my own money on, um, I certainly do spend a lot more on, on data than the average person, but it's my job. And so it's kind of like perk of the job, but, uh, you know, there are devices out there that are available. Things like, um, Lumen by Metaflow. Uh, is a device. If you pre-order my book, actually, you can get a discount fifty percent, fifty dollars off of this device. But it's a respiratory quotient monitor, and it what it really teaches you is: Are you metabolically flexible? Mm -hmm. Are you able to move from fat metabolism to carb metabolism, from carb metabolism to fat metabolism, and back? So, can you easily fast? Can you um, go a few meal? Can you go a meal without eating? Can you? Um, can, you know, do, can you, can you change up your macronutrients and still, and be able to metabolize them effectively? Like metabolic flexibility is a really great marker of overall health. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for maintaining optimal mitochondrial function. So it's a, it's a really cool device that you can get um, over the counter. And I love, I love this company. I'm an advisor of the company and I just did, a, I just did a webinar with them today. So that was fun. But, um, it's a cool, it's a really cool tool. I also do like continuous glucose monitors. Um, you can get these from companies like Levels Health uh, and in England, Super Sapiens, I believe. And like, these are basically companies that are prescribing CGMs, but they're also prescribing um, like with the CGM, they're bu building like a software app on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I've been using CGMs for like, I just turned mine on. I have one on my arm right now and I've been using mine for like, I don't know since 2014 off and on and they used to be prescription only and now you can like use these companies to get a prescription which is pretty cool what does the cgm stand for so a cgm is like you can see that my blood sugar is actually i you can't really see it because it's like uh 83. it's like 83 right yeah. now um <clears throat> you know it's like five o'clock it's probably you know it's been normal for me to start feeling hungry around this time mm -hmm. um but it's a it's basically measuring your blood sugar and mm. 20 it's like measuring it every few minutes, every day for, you know, two weeks. And I love this tool. And I, and I teach about it in this online course that I have, and it's pretty, you know, advanced stuff. And eventually everybody will use these, but it teaches me what my fasting glucose is. What is my liver insulin? Your fasting glucose tells you how, how insulin sensitive you are in your liver mm -hmm. and how well your body's creating blood sugar at baseline without eating any food. And then it also tells you how your body responds after meals, which is also a pretty good indicator of how well your muscles dispose of glucose. So mm -hmm. exercise, eating the right foods, not stressing out too much, um, making sure that you have proper micronutrient status, making sure you avoid pollution, um, things like that are going to make a big difference in your blood sugar mm -hmm. and, and getting the right macros for your body. You know, like some people really do better on higher carbohydrate diets and some people do better on lower car carbohydrate diets, but in this, this device can show you what works for you. Mm. Yeah. That's so cool. I think the thing that I struggle with, with lab work, um, yeah. like going to a general pr practitioner is like, they'll do all that blood work and give me they the won't results. Interpret it. Yeah. Exactly. And then I'm yeah. like, I have no idea what to do with this. Well, there's a great website that I was just on another podcast today called selfhacked.com. And they have a self decode software program where you can upload your data. You can like plug in your numbers and they can give you even better recommendations mm -hmm. on, um, on your, on your body. So there's a lot of direct to consumer stuff that's coming out. And like, part of the reason why I'm like, you know, in this space of biohacking is because a lot of people just don't know about this stuff. You know, they don't know where to go for these things. It's like, I've been doing this for years, but not everybody knows all the things that I know. I mean, like, 
Sure. You know, I've, I've, I've optimized a lot of different things. I'm also a big fan of this thing, this aura ring, yeah. like love, love, love mm-hmm. my aura ring. You know, like it tells me so much about my body. Yeah. Although this one isn't sinking right now and I'm really annoyed. I'm like, I got to do a factory reset. Yeah, no. This thing, I love perfect. this thing, but it's like, it hasn't been working for a few days. So I got to get it set up, reset up. But I love this thing when it's working. And then, um, and then what else? Let's see. Well, so um, what was that? Tell me one more time, the direct-to-consumer website, the software. Oh, love. Oh, self-decode. Yeah, I'll send self-decode. you guys. A, I'll send you some. Actually, I'll send you links to all these things. Awesome. Um, I'll, yeah, my, yeah. I'll send you my levels um, link and then I'll send you just a variety of other things. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about, I want to talk about alternative milks because it's so prevalent everywhere. And like you see all these different milks, oat milks, coconut milks, hemp milks, you know, macadamia nut milk. And I know you you speak specifically to this in the book on the, uh, particularly oat milk. Um, So let's talk about oat milk first and then um, kind of compare the different alternative milks. So oat milk is a controversial topic for a lot of people because one of the things that people don't realize about it is that it's basically oats that have been enzymatically broken down by, um, by it's, it's by enzymes. Like, so this, so one of my friends is actually the founder of Oatly and I'm not here to trash all oat milks and tell everyone that they shouldn't drink oat milk. I just think it's important for people to realize that not everyone's going to metabolize oat milk the same. Mm -hmm. So a lot, a lot of what a lot of people don't realize is that oat milk has a fairly high glycemic index because it's basically liquid carbohydrates mm-hmm. mixed with some vegetable oil, which is delicious and it tastes amazing. But you really should wear a glucose monitor or at least grab a glucose. Um, like you, you, you can buy you know finger stick gl- glucose testing at any Walgreens or CVS. But you want to measure and see how is your body responding to this? Because some people find that they get very large blood sugar spikes Mm -hmm. and they didn't know it because they thought it was a health food. So Mm -hmm. I don't recommend oat milk generally, but that's mostly because I've seen it cause um, pretty high blood sugar spikes on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it sounds like we don't see that across the board with other alternative milks like coconut or hemp. Well, that's the thing. So some people are more adapted to carbohydrates and do well with more plants like oats, for example. And then some people are more adapted to fats and they do better with things like, you know, almonds and macadamias and things like that. So I think it partially depends on your adaptation to carbohydrates or fats. And also the sourcing of these products as well matters. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on whole milk or, or... So I think raw milk is actually probably fine for some people. Um, I don't recommend, I mean, my family in Arizona are dairy farmers and it's funny because I don't really recommend regular milk in general, the homogenized pasteurized forms. It's just not that great because of a variety of reasons. It's like a lot of the benefits have been taken out by the processing, but I mean, I would, I have had, um, I personally drank like raw milk at my friend's place and it was delicious. And I was like, man, if I could get raw milk regularly, I would drink this all the time, but it's not easy to get. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, I'm, I definitely eat some cheese, but I'm not huge on large amounts of dairy products in general. Although I do enjoy cottage cheese and cheese and butter. Um, I try for some reason, milk, I think is problematic for people. Um, when it comes to, you know, their digestion. So I see more and more people have issues with lactose intolerance and milk, um, milk allergies are really not uncommon. Yeah. What I think is really interesting is I'll experience that myself. Um, and then my partner and I will travel to Europe or or something and And it's fine. And there's no issue. Well, there's a reason for that. So the cows we raise in America, do have different treatments given to them in order to keep them healthy. And so that's one facet. There are, you know, there are things in our milk that we should, that we probably wouldn't want to be consuming. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, is, um, you know, we make milk very shelf stable in America and it's designed to like have a really long shelf life. And that's why it's pasteurized, homogenized, And that's why it's produced in a way that is um, preserved often so that it can travel long distances. Mm -hmm. Now in Europe, most of the economies are local economies. So like the French food system is the French food system. The Portuguese food system is the Portuguese food system. The Europeans, you know, they they obviously do have, you know, they do ship things across lines. But when you go to France, you eat French food, right? And in America, 
when you go to America, you eat American food and the food is largely packaged, processed, industrialized, industrially produced foods designed for long shelf lives for a large market for a large country. So Mm -hmm. as a result, you're getting stuff that's been, you know, on like, for example, like beans are delicious, but like a lot of the beans on the counter, like over the, like that you buy at the, at the grocery store have been there for like years. Mm -hmm. And so like a lot of the products, like Twinkies, for example, there there's like been, you know, stories on how like Twinkies don't break down. Like there's a lot of preservatives in our food in America. It's part of the reason why we have such a sick country. Part of the reason why we have microbiomes that are dysfunctional because our food system is designed for longevity, but it's not designed for our longevity. It's designed for the food's longevity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of foods in other countries are very fresh. Um, When you go to Israel, you're getting local dairy. You're not getting dairy necessarily from America. You're getting dairy that's come from a local, local purveyor. So it doesn't have to have the same processing. And, um, you know, and, and that's, that's part of the reason why we have a different world. We have a different world. And also what the cows are eating is different too. Mm -hmm. So like when cows are consuming, large amounts of grains and soybeans, they're going to, they're going to have a different microbiome than they naturally would if they were just grazing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of cows in other countries are just grazing naturally on fields. Mm -hmm. It changes the makeup of the milk. Yeah. Hello friends. Perhaps you've heard me talk about Remedy Plus before on this podcast, or you've seen me post about them on social media. I love this brand because they make the tastiest performance boosting products I've ever tried. And what makes Remedy Plus super special is that they use only the finest plant-based ingredients so you can feel great knowing that you're energizing your body naturally. Two of my favorite Remedy Plus products are their delicious chocolate berry flavored protein bar and their cinnamon agave flavored energy shot. And now these two great items are going to be made available for purchase together in Remedy Plus's newest offering, the Power Pack. Each Power Pack contains one protein bar and one energy shot. And it is a super smart way to fuel your body either before a workout or simply to tie you over in between meals. Look, we all know that when your batteries are running low, performance levels are completely affected. I choose to incorporate Remedy Plus into my daily routine because I want to get the most out of my day and I want to do so naturally. Remedy Plus products taste great and they help me raise my game in everything I do. See what Remedy Plus can do for you. Visit www.myremedyproducts.com to learn more. And if you use code ROSY20, you will save 20% off of all of their great performance supporting products. That's myremedyproducts.com. Use the code ROSY20. Or you can simply go to the info button of this podcast and click the link. So that reminds me of... All of our different um, labels we have on things like eggs and milk, we see pasture raised, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Grass fed. We mm-hmm. see organic. We see egg eggs in particular. I feel like such a tricky one because people will see um, what is the distinction? You'll see pasture raised and you'll see cage free, which I think are two very different things, and they don't mean the same thing. Right. Yeah. And it's a little bit tricky to read a label and, and yeah. really understand what it is that you're buying. Yeah. And I we, mean, I just yeah. got eggs literally from a farmer, like a friend of mine who was, a, he just brought me fresh eggs. And it's like, that is lucky. I'm like really, really lucky. But I do have a lot of friends who have their own chickens and they know what the chickens are eating. And so, like, you know, the best eggs I have found are from people that you know who have chickens. But yeah. if you can't get that, then the pastured, um, chicken, the pastured eggs are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like one brand in America. I'm trying to think of the name. There's like a, it's like a really beautiful branded egg. And it's like the yolks are super orange and they're like clearly pastured and they're more expensive, but they do mm-hmm. taste different. Like they yeah. really do taste different than yeah. the the conventional ones are of these bright, light, light yellow yolks that mm-hmm. are like, they don't look natural. And then you get like the, um, the color of the yolks and these, you know, fresh eggs are just like so orange because these chickens have been grazing on grubs and stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking Vital Farms. That's the one, yeah. in, at least in our area that I There's, know. Vital is Farms is good. And then I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of this brand, but it's like a, it's like a beautiful brand and I can't think of the name of it. I have to mm. like, I have to like jog my memory. 
if, if it comes to you, you can email me later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about cooking oils then, because there's sure. a big difference between a fruit oil, like an olive oil or sure. avocado and uh, canola. I mean, the entire vegetable oil interest, industry and fruit oil industry is rife with controversy. So yeah. I'm going to just put that out there. Like first, first of all, like a lot of avocado oil is rancid. And a lot of it is not avocado oil. A lot of olive oil is rancid and a lot of olive oil is not olive oil. So like just because things are fruit oils does not make them perfect. I literally have friends in Italy that send me oil directly from farms. Like I'm super spoiled. I'm admitting this on the podcast. Like I go, I'm a health influencer. I go out of my way to source things directly from places where I know I can, I know the people who make the products. Mm -hmm. Like that's not, a, not everybody's able to do that, but that is how I like to live. I mean, I go way out of my way to source the highest quality things to put inside my body. That is a choice that I make because I believe that health is wealth more than anything else. And I'd rather spend more money on things that I know are good for me than just buy anything I can find at the store. Now, will I use store-bought olive oil? Yeah, of course. Like I'm not perfect, but it's key to understand that like one of the bigger issues with things like a lot of mainstream vegetable oils is the fact that they are they are produced in um, factories that require lots of chemicals to go from the seed to the actual oil. So they, I mean, there's videos of this you can watch on canola oil production, but like they have to like steam treat them and then they have to pour hexane on them and then they have to bleach them. And then the, there's all sorts of stuff that has to be done to them. By the time that's happened, there's a lot of oxidation that's happened to the oil. And so you really want to eat oil that's unoxidized, which means you really need to source them properly and you need to store them properly. But a lot of these oils are stored in clear containers and these clear containers are, you know, subject to light. I store my olive oil. I have like a, I have like a, a, a clear jar of olive oil that's sitting outside my stove that I'm using mm -hmm. consistently, but I'm refilling it from a large tin container that's stored in the dark mm -hmm. to keep that olive oil probably stored. So that's, that's a little different. It's a different approach. Now, like coconut oil, you know, initially everyone's like, Oh man, it's like coconut oil is fine. But like, I wouldn't abuse the coconut oil either. Like, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it is saturated fat and you don't want to overconsume saturated fat, just like you don't want to overconsume sugar. You know, like we don't want to overconsume anything. We want to have a balanced diet. And that's, that's, that's nourishing to us. I do consume some coconut oil, but it's not like I'm, I like consume large quantities of this regularly. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a bulletproof coffee drinker, even though when I'm at the bulletproof conference, I do enjoy it. And it's like a serious treat, but I don't drink that every day because it spikes my lipids. You know, it makes my, my, my blood fats go too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, when we're looking at this stuff in a grocery store, let's say maybe we don't have access to, mm -hmm. or the bandwidth, right? Or the energetic yeah. wherewithal to, yeah. to go through and find something that's grown on a farm and we know who sure. has manufactured it. Is there anything that you would suggest if we're looking at our local grocery store's shelf to look for that would give us more of the help? I mean, benefits? ideally containers that are dark containers so that they're not going to let a lot of light in. That's a big you one. You mentioned tin. I mean, I use tinned olive oil because mm -hmm. it's like in, it's, it's clearly dark, right? So yeah. that can help too. But you can also look in the back of olive oil containers and see when they were, when they were made. Mm -hmm. So when were they pressed? How old is this oil? You know, like I want preferably fresher oil than unfresh oil. Um, and then, you know, because I, because of Anthony Gustin's work and discovering that a lot of um, the avocado oils are rancid. So I, I do, I do consume avocado oil if it's like, I know it's a good brand and it's fresh, but you need to like look on the back of it, find out when it was made, find out where it was made. Um, and then there's a company that is, I'm an advisor of, but I'm, I'm, I'm an advisor because I'm a big believer of this company. They create a cultured oil. It's called, um, zero acre farms. So they use yeast to convert carbohydrates into oil. And then they squeeze the yeast and then the oil comes out. And it's really simple pr pr procedure, but it's made in a bioreactor and it comes, it's like super high monounsaturated fat, which is probably some of the best kind of fat to consume. Mm -hmm. um, and I find this oil is like, I, I, I probably will never use another cooking oil again. Like it's, it tastes very lightly buttery, kind of like macadamia nut oil, but without any nutty taste. It's got a slightly nutty taste, but it's very faint. It's super clean. 
And it, I mean, I have noticed zero impact on my health with it in a negative way. In fact, I feel like it's improved my health. So I am a big fan of this company because the stuff does not go rancid easily. It's stored in a metal container and metal bottle. So it's it's not going to get oxidized through light. And it just tastes good. And like, to me, like, I know what rancid oil tastes like. Mm-hmm. It tastes kind of like plasticky. It tastes rancid. It tastes sour and it tastes like it's gone bad. It tastes like funny, right? Mm-hmm. If you learn to know what rancidity tastes like, you'll learn to avoid it. But what I love about this Sierra Acre Farm stuff is like, I literally was like, oh my God, dude, like you figured it out. Like, how do we get this stuff in, you know, all these, I mean, all, all, all I don't eat fried food, but like one of the biggest downsides of fried food is like people are refrying foods over and over and over again because, and, and that's causing oxidization of the, um, of the, uh, of the oils. And one of the things that I de- I definitely screwed up on during the pandemic was like, I'm, I lived in the Midwest and I started eating a little bit more normally, like a normal person would eat, would eat. Mm-hmm. and adding like fried food and typical vegetable oil to my diet, like ruined my skin, made me gain weight. Like it was not helpful. Yeah. So this is zero acre farms. You said? Yeah. Zero acre farms is an awesome product. Like <laughs> I, I will probably know. I mean, I don't use a lot of vegetable oil. So keep in mind, like I don't cook with a lot of oil, but when I do, I use this and it makes a major difference in the quality of the cuisine that I, that I consume. Like I do sometimes use ghee. Um, I'll render my own fat and make my own ghee, but like, or so I'll, I'll render my own fat and make my own tallow sometimes and I'll do, but I'll, I'll do my own ghee. But like, I, I definitely try not to overdo the oils in general. Like I don't, I really try to avoid a lot of excess oil in, in my diet. I, olive oil is that one exception. I do consume a fair amount of olive oil. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, sugar, another hot topic you mentioned. Sugar. Um, sugar is sugar is sugar, some people say. What about fruit sugars? I mean, I believe in whole fruit. I mm-hmm. really do. I really, really do. But keep in mind that we are hybridizing fruit so that it's highly sugar laden. So... Like I love blueberries, but if I eat a cup of frozen blueberries, I actually will see a blood sugar spike sometimes. So I got to be a little bit careful with certain sugars. Like I don't do well with a lot of pineapple and mango, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop not eat it when, I, when I'm like in a tropical environment. So I like to be local with my, with my fruit, like whatever is like in season is stuff that I'm going to go pursue more so than other types of fruit. So I do a lot of berries. I'll do like persimmons occasionally in the winter time, but I'm not going to like... I'm not going to like overdo fruit for me. It's not something that I overdo because they will spike my blood sugar, but that's not how my body metabolizes it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like, uh, I, I, I mean, I love dates personally, and I make these, um, maple cashew almond butter stuffed dates covered in ceremonial Mm -hmm. cacao. And they are so tasty and they don't spike my blood sugar because there's a little bit of fat on top of the, the dates. And I, I just like, I love making my own candy, you know, like out of dates, but I don't eat these things in excess, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to eat like one date, you know, I'm not going to eat like six of these things, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, that, that is another thing. Like, but I have friends that are vegans and they're super carb adapted and they will eat like, it's like a lot of dates. (laughs) They'll eat like 10 to 20 (laughs) dates in a sitting and they'll be fine. And like, I do think that there are people out there that go on the high carb, high fruit diets and they do fine with them. That's not me. And that's okay. But, and it's okay if other people can do it, but it's okay if it doesn't work for you. But, but the thing about fruit is that there's a lot of people who are like, oh my God, fruit, you're going to get diabetes. I'm like, no, there's absolutely no evidence that fruit causes diabetes. Like fruit juice and fructose are not optimal for health. I wouldn't drink a ton of juice. But I do, I mean, I'll drink like a half a cup of juice when I'm on, you know, like when I'm in an environment where there's fresh juice being made. Mm -hmm. But like, do I make that a big part of my life regularly? No, I don't drink a lot of liquid sugar for a reason because it's going to get metabolized really quickly. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I don't have smoothies. That doesn't mean, I just, when I do smoothies, I do like half fruit, half vegetables. And so I get the fruit taste, but I don't eat a lot. I don't, I I won't do like a whole fruit smoothie. That just, uh, that would, that, that'll just cause me to get my blood sugar spike. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm thinking about, and I don't know if I really want to go into this topic because I have more questions I want to ask you and I don't want to run out of time. But I guess because we're on the subject just briefly of juice, I'm thinking about like cold pressed juices and this craze of like uh, juice fasting or a juice cleanse. I mean, I've done a juice cleanse before and frankly, the entire time I felt very unstable. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I, I think juice cleansing is like more of a, cha- it's a challenge on the system than it is a cleanse. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a huge fan of juice cleansing, to be honest with you, but that doesn't mean I don't like juice. It's just ever, everything I know now about blood sugar has taught me that like liquid sugars really just aren't optimal for most people. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't recommend a juice cleanse on, in general. Now, if you find the juice cleanse works for you, great. I went to the master cleanse and I hated it. It was miserable. So it's like lemon juice and ma- maple syrup. Obviously that's not a juice cleanse. Oh, I have, um, there used to be this company Thistle in San Francisco. They used to make these insanely fresh pressed cold pressed juices. And I loved them when I was younger. I mean, I loved them. They were so delicious. But then I started wearing a glucose monitor and I realized that they were spiking my blood sugar. And I even noticed that green juices can spike my blood sugar in excess. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. That, that does that mean I'll never have a green juice? No, but I'm more likely to have a green smoothie that like has the entire like the entire, you know, all everything in it than I am to just drink a straight up juice. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) I'm so curious because my husband loves our, we have one of those Omega juicers and he loves making them. And I'm, I'm always kind of like, I mean, the pure veggie, the pure veggie juices are awesome. And frankly, like, you know, there's a lot of, there's like, what, who was it? It was, um, the Gerson protocol for cancer, like they recommend enormous amounts of juice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that protocol probably works for people who um, are best on more of a plant-based diet, Um, but it's not going to work for everybody. So Mm -hmm. like, keep in mind that like the best way to know if this thing is working for you is to test, put a blood sugar monitor on, see what happens when you drink that juice. And you'll know if you're causing damage to your blood vessels or not. Mm Because if your blood blood sugar is regularly going over 140 every time you drink juice, you know, you're damaging your blood vessels. Well, so on that subject, what is the range? What is like a healthy, if I'm wearing a glucose monitor, what's the range I'm looking for? I mean, I would aim for fasting blood sugar to be less than a hundred, ideally less than 90, um, preferably less than 85. Postprandial blood sugar, less than 140, ideally less than 120. Optimal will be less than 110 after meals. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, this question is for both Rosie and I, because we are both training for a marathon. Oh yeah. Uh, and I want to talk about nutrition as it relates to like high performance athletes. And I don't know that I would necessarily call myself that I'd let Rosie speak for herself. Yeah. I'm a lay person who wants to run a marathon and finish it and feel good and not like fall down and die afterwards. Yeah. 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 <laughs> totally. So I mean, I've got thinking... a good story for you. Oh yeah. Tell me please. So a friend of mine and I were, were working on a CGM company a while back and we discovered that, um, you know, she'd never, she'd never fasted before. And I was like, well, fasting changed my life and helped improve my health. And she's like, well, teach me how to fast. So I taught her how to fast and she decides to run a marathon. And I'm like, wait, you're not really trained for a marathon. And she's like, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm like, okay, cool. Sounds great. So she'd been learning how to fast. She'd been experimenting with carbohydrate, um, like nutritional periodization, where she was doing, you know, higher carb meals, lower carb meals. She was doing um, a little bit of ketosis. She was building metabolic flexibility. Mm-hmm. And she went and ran this race with her friend and her friend um, bonked and her friend had been training for months and she was training on a high carb diet. And the reason why she bonked is because she ran out of carbohydrates and she wasn't able to tap into her fat stores. Mm -hmm. And that's because she wasn't metabolically flexible because she was carb adapted, but she wasn't fat adapted. So my friend who's fat adapted, not only finishes the race, but beats her friend. And so the moral of the story is like, of course you should train for marathons, but you should probably train your metabolism too. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why it's great to get one of the Lumen devices because that's going to help you actually see if you're able to flip the, flip the metabolic switch. So you can see if you're exercising, like you could stop during an exercise session and you could actually like do before exercise, after exercise, and you could literally see, is your body burning through your glycogen? Are you tapping into fat or are you, if you're not, then what you're doing is you're breaking down your muscle to make glucose. Mm. And so you can see all of this. Mm. And it's one of those things where it's like, not common knowledge right now to understand metabolic flexibility, but it's really key for athletes to be able to be able to tap into their own fat stores. 
And so there's this concept of training low, which is like occasionally running, you know, occasionally doing some exercises where you are running on low glycogen on purpose. Now I wouldn't do every single time you exercise on low glycogen, but low intensity cardio on low glycogen occasionally, um, could be helpful for building a bit more metabolic flexibility and tapping into your fat stores. It can also raise your cortisol. So you got to be careful with your stress levels and make sure not to do too many of these because these are stressing. These are what are called stress, like mito, mitohormetic stressors, mm -hmm. which is like you're stressing your mitochondria to make them stronger, mm -hmm. but you don't want to do too many all at once. You want to make sure that you don't overdo the exercise and don't overdo the ketosis and don't overdo the fasting. You got to be careful with how you dose these things as a woman because too much of these things can make you more, um, can, it can actually cause too much stress on the body. Yeah. I have so many questions about that. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do I, we just, I just need to schedule a session with you if that's something you do. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So a uh, non-negotiable exercise you talk about in the book is weight training. Will you tell us why? Yeah. I mean, weight training is really key because your muscles are big, giant battery packs. And so if you don't weight train, you're going to lose muscle mass as you get older. It's inevitable. And you're also going to lose bone mass. And so building bone density when you're young is so important, but it's also really, really important to maintain your bone density. So there's been a lot of women in my life that I'm friends with who have lost bone density because they stopped their periods because they weren't consuming enough food for their exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem in women. Um, is like over exercising and under under eating in the women who do exercise. So a lot more women who don't exercise and overeat. But um but uh that being said, you know, weight training is like your muscles are like muscles are basically the organ of longevity. And so if you do regularly use your muscles, then you're regularly going to find that your body is going to be stronger. You're going to have better blood sugar metabolism. You're going to have greater, like feeling more, feeling more strength is just a really good experience in general. You have better physique. A lot of women are like, well, I don't want to get super muscular. I'm like, trust me, you're not going to look like a bodybuilder unless you start bodybuilding. Like yeah. <laughs> when I, the mo like the vast majority, like when I work out and I'm weightlifting consistently, I just get leaner. Mm -hmm. But my body composition changes, but my weight doesn't always change. So like, I don't use weightlifting to lose weight. I use weightlifting to get a better physique and to have better body composition. So if you're looking to like lose weight, it's really about what you're eating and how much you're eating. But if you're looking to have a better body shape, then weight training is one of the best ways to get there. Yeah. I find that. And now I've been weight training since college and I love it for all the reasons that you mentioned. And the first it, it, first and foremost, because I love to feel strong in my body and, yeah. I, and I want my body to last me a long time because yeah. I have a lot of it. But I think about, you know, I think a lot of people feel intimidated, like say, for example, by going to the gym for the first time and not even knowing where to start with these weights. I know, I know. So I would highly recommend like getting a trainer just for a few sessions, just to get the form in place. Like there is an app called FitBot and they will show you videos of each exercise, but you got to have to like zoom in and really like see what, like you have to really watch them properly. Yeah. If you can follow directions, great, but there's really no replacement for getting trained on how to weight train. Mm -hmm. I had a boyfriend who did this for me years ago and I'll forever be indebted to him because he taught me a lifelong skill of yeah. maintaining proper form and I've never had an injury in the gym. Another big thing that's really important is distraction. So if you're weight weight lifting in the gym and you get distracted and you lose that like that brain what's called neuromuscular connection, it can really hurt yourself. So I definitely don't recommend doing weight training if you're sleep deprived or if you're not paying attention. Yeah. Really, really good points. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Molly, we've come to the end of our time and I don't want to let you go. I just continue <laughs> this forever. Aww. So I just want to say thank you for this body of work. I actually um, am, am going to listen to the audiobook too. Awesome. I, I recorded you... it myself. I know. That's I looked yeah. and I was like, oh, I'm so excited because I love it when the authors read their own work. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for this amazing body of work. And I love all of it. And I hope everyone has something to take away. I'm curious though, for you, what is your takeaway from this conversation? What would you like people to leave with today? I think what I want people to leave with is we need to get past this dietary dogma of there's like, there's one way, right way to eat. Like there's a world where people who are, who are, have ancestral diets or Mediterranean diets or vegan vegetarian diets or zone diets, you name it. There's a world where we can all coexist and we don't have to buy into this idea that like 
you're wrong if you eat one diet or that other person's wrong if they eat one diet. Like what we're really learning is that there's a whole spectrum of what works for different people. And when you find out what works for you, your body starts to change in ways that work for you, like that, that work for you. So like a lot of people think that for PCOS, you, you can't be, you know, vegan or vegetarian because you can't be high carb. But as you're showing, you definitely can. And at the same time, some people thrive on a different diet, right? Like I do well with animal products. That's just me. And like, maybe that'll change in 20 years if I get older. But we, we, we need to stop fighting with one another about our nutrition and start learning to like love our bodies and love what our bodies can do for us. And like, really just the key is no matter what you eat, eating whole foods, sourcing high quality whole foods is really the secret to longevity and, and, and optimal health. Mm, mic drop. And that's how we can radically love ourselves. <laughs> Thank you so much, Molly. It's been an absolute pleasure. I have enjoyed this immensely. Thank you so much, Tessa. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.